I'll try to be brief. I know that we're approaching the lunch break, and I will start right away by uh, telling you what is the subject of this uh, paper that I've, I've been writing, uh, dealing with the failure of judicial systems during armed conflicts. Uh, the aim of uh, this study is to compare judicial systems of three different states during an armed conflict to assess, first of all, how armed conflicts have an impact on judicial systems and whether a pattern emerges from one conflict to another. The selected um, case studies that I've conducted in the past year uh, include the Serbian Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina during the war in the early 90s, uh, Germany uh, prior to and during the Second World War, and the Ottoman Empire during the First World War. Now, there's a small caveat here. Although we have three uh, states selected for this study, this is not an issue of comparing them ideologically, and they should not be perceived as being equated to one another. Um, each of these uh, conflicts had their own uh, political and historical background, so what we're doing is strictly comparing the judicial system. Um, with respect to the sources, of course, there is a variety of, of sources available depending on the conflict. Of course, we discussed uh, yesterday with uh, Dr. Ungor the issue of the uh, accessibility of the uh, Ottoman archives and the, specifically the military archives in Turkey, which are still not uh, entirely available. Uh, whereas in the former Yugoslavia, the work that has been conducted at the ICTY has unearthed uh, an immense uh, body of, uh, of uh, documentation, and, and the same applies to uh, Nazi Germany. I'd like to start with a small illustration. Um, we're placing ourselves on the 3rd of June, 1992, in the northern Bosnian town of Teslic. On that day, a group of 30 men, uh, who were known as the Miche group, stormed the city of Teslic, um, arrested a number of prominent figures of Muslim and uh, Croatian background, and started arresting, as well, the civilian population. Uh, they were uh, incarcerated and detained in the worst possible conditions, beaten up, uh, tortured, and uh, a number of them succumbed to uh, this treatment. Now, um, when this happened, of course, uh, and just prior to the, the, this, uh, this storming in, looking at this map of, of the municipality of Teslic, you will see that uh, this is a mixed uh, community. Uh, the dots in blue indicate the Serb community, which was in majority. Uh, the green dots uh, show you the uh, Croatian community and the, oh, no, the, the Muslim community, and the red dots show you the uh, Croatian community in, in Teslic. Now, there is not a single municipality in Bosnia and Herzegovina where you will find a uh, absolute majority uh, with respect to one ethnic group. There's always a mix. You always have uh, a Muslim or Croatian or Serbian uh, primary uh, ethnic group surrounded by others. So uh, there, there is no uh, ethnically, there was no ethnically pure municipality before uh, the war. Now, at the end of June, so less than 30 days after this Miche group entered the town, uh, this group was arrested by uh, the federal police and the uh, local Bosnian Serb police. But only after this Miche group had turned its attention from the Muslims and Croats to the Serb uh, civilian population. This document, which is a report of the Tesla municipality uh, war staff, reports that the fury among the people, especially the soldiers, reached its climax at the moment when they learned that some of the Serbian women whose husbands were at the fronts had been raped. So you see here, it is only when this criminal group turned its attention to the majority group's uh, community that the Serb leadership in Teslic reacted. Now, this group was arrested. 16 members of the group were arrested. And they were investigated. And a, um, a request for, um, I don't know, I'm not sure if you're able to see it on the screen, but a request, a request for an investigation was initiated in early July. However, very quickly, the police and the army sent a uh, letter to the prosecutor, to the chief prosecutor. So this is 17 days after their arrest. Um, the uh, chief of the, the regional center in Doboy sends a uh, letter to the prosecutor saying that the individuals who were arrested must be 
uh, released as they are needed at the front lines, and numerous other documents of the kind are available in the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. Now, um, unfortunately, what happened is indeed the perpetrators were released one by one, and by the end of July, all of the 16 members of the Miche group who were arrested were released, reintegrated their units, and it is only 22 years later, November of last year, that they were finally arrested in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So justice is still to be done in that case. However, at the ICTY, there are six separate trials which dealt with the crimes in Teslic and with the Miche group. So uh, members of the uh, civilian and military leadership have been held accountable uh, for their acts. However, the direct perpetrators were running free in the Serb Republic of Bosnia and Republika Srpska. So I, I've used this example as an illustration of how the judicial system can be corrupted during an armed conflict to serve the purposes of the elite. Um, there are some factors which will allow us to uh, kind of establish of how, um, uh, how, how adequate prosecution of war crimes can be conducted during an armed conflict uh, and, and how, unfortunately, the, the judicial system can be corrupted. Uh, first of all, what we look at, and these are factors that I've drawn up based on the experience that we have at the tribunals, uh, we look at the existence of a functioning judicial system. And in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, and in the case of Germany, and in the case of the Ottoman Empire, there were functioning judicial systems. But what we see very often, and this is a pattern that has emerged, is the purge or replacement of judges and prosecutor based on ethnic affiliation. Uh, we look at the types of cases that are tried. Very often, uh, the judicial system, uh, due to influence, is forced to focus on minor crimes rather than dealing with the most severe crimes that are occurring right in front of their eyes. Uh, there's the issue of whether investigations are genuine during an armed conflict. And, uh, of course, uh, the final one is the role played by members of the judicial system during campaigns of persecution. Um, I'd like to start with the example of the German judicial system from 1933 to 1945. Now, by 1933, if you have a picture of the judicial system and, and the judges that formed the body of, of, of judges in, in, in Germany, uh, we had a largely conservative body of judges. Most of the liberal, liberal judges and prosecutors had been purged from the system starting from the late 19th century under Bismarck's rule. So there was already uh, quite a conservative uh, bench uh, that was uh, sympathetic to the new uh, National uh, Socialist Party, the Nazi Party that was founded by Hitler. So um, during the interwar period, between the First and Second World War, Nazi violence was uh, on the increase, and the courts were uh, simply ignoring the visible agenda of the Nazi. There are several books uh, written on this issue. One of them is Otto, uh, uh, sorry, Ingo Mueller's book on the judicial system. Uh, and uh, another book has come up about the Nazi, uh, the Nazi law uh, in Germany. Um, what we have here uh, is an interesting document. Now, some of you may think, or m many of us may think, that Germany during or prior to the Second World War was a free-for-all, that there were no courts, no judicial system, uh, or that you know everything that was taking place was uh, done outside the uh, formal structure. However, a judicial system was still in place. It remained. And what we have here is a Hitler's own appeal to create a bar, uh, a German bar, or a National uh, Socialist German Workers' Party uh, jurist uh, group to pretty much, and the last sentence is what's interesting here, it's to, um, uh, to, 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 to implement their work from a national socialist point of view, which shows that although Hitler may have been seen as the despot and the tyrant and the incredibly nasty character that he was, he still was concerned about providing a certain veil of legality to what was happening back then. Now, what happened quickly in 1930 was uh, that a number of laws were adopted suspending several constitutional rights in 1933, inc including the freedom of expression, freedom of press, right of assembly, etc. And we have here um, a law from the 20th of February, well, pretty much providing that, that those, the suspension of these rights. Now, these are documents which you will find in what was called the justice case at the Nuremberg trials. It's a very thick 
uh, document, well, judgment and, and, and all the documentation amount to over a thousand pages of documentation. And the laws are incorporated and translated there. So it's a very interesting body of, of, of law to, to analyze. Um, there is a law adopted on the 7th of April, 1933. Uh, may I, may I, how fast did we go here? Hang on a second. Yes, this is the one, uh, which is uh, the, the, the law concerning the admission to the bar, which uh, seems to now uh, refuse the admission to the bar to uh, non-Aryan descendants. So 1933 is already quite early, but uh, uh, Jewish, uh, obviously, um, uh, lawyers were being already refused admission to the bar at that time. Um, another law, well, part of the, the Nazi laws uh, adopted in the 30s, was the law for the protection of the German blood and honor. So again, you can see that through these laws, there is a certain concern to establish uh, legal uh, regulations which will determine the fate of, of, these, of these groups, of minority, minority groups. And what's interesting here is why are they even bothering to adopt these laws if they are about to uh, create, cause all these uh, discriminatory policies. I believe that part of the, the law saved, served their own purpose, to create fear and terror that there is now this policy and it is clearly enshrined in, uh, in writing. Now, well, I was talking about one of the factors earlier, which was the purge of judges. Uh, as I said, the German legal profession had already been purged from liberal judges. So the body of judges that we had were mainly conservative. Um, and uh, again, in 1933, there was this law for the restoration of the professional civil service. Well, civil servants who are not of Aryan descent are, are to be retired. Uh, and there was a small exception for those who had fought during the First World War. Um, now, I'll move quickly through, through the, uh, um, uh, the evidence because there's, there's such a rich body. Uh, and I want to show you here a directive which was sent to the judges on the approach to adopt uh, with respect to cases involving Jewish persons. This is a letter from the Justice Minister in 1942. I mean, there was a Ministry of Justice, again, a fully functioning body. And uh, this was in reaction to a judgment. And I'd like to read it to you here. The Minister of Justice is saying that the ruling of the district court, which had adopted this decision, in form and content matter, borders on embarrassing a German administrative authority to the advantage of the Jewry. The judge should have asked himself the question, what is the reaction of the Jew to this 20-page long ruling which certifies that he and the 500 other Jews are right? and that he won over a German authority, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that already the policy starts from the top with the German Minister of, uh, of Justice. Um, another uh, aspect of the German judicial system was the establishment of the People's Court, presided for a very long period by Roland Freisler. Uh, in 11 years, this court handed down five, over 5,000 death sentences. And this is kind of a parallel judicial system. The, the People's Court did not exist uh, in, in the form that it was developed by the Nazis uh, in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, essentially, the defendant had no realistic opportunity of defense. One, one uh, author, uh, and this is the, the book that I was talking about, The Law in Nazi Germany, uh, puts it this way, Friesler abandoned all pretense of judicial impartiality, cast off any veneer of judicial dignity, and remorselessly hectored his hapless defendants with a savage that actually embarrassed some of the Nazi leadership. Now, let's move on to uh, Republika Srpska. And again, I'm not comparing one uh, nation to another here. We're looking at the judicial system. Uh, so this is not a case of saying that uh, what we're looking at now resembles to what we saw earlier. Uh, just a very brief background for those of you who are not familiar with the context. Uh, this is a map of the former Yugoslavia before its collapse with all the, the republics uh, which formed it. Uh, the Serb uh, Republic uh, is within Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is a map that shows you the orange part is the what we know today as Republika Srpska. This is uh, part of uh, what was uh, Radovan Karadzic's uh, breakaway uh, entity, if I can put it that way. Now, uh, when um, in 1992 Republika Srpska was formed, uh, it took over the, the existing ju judicial institutions that existed at the time um, in the municipality. So as 
the Serb forces were taking over one municipality after another. They took over all the official functions, the courts, the municipal assembly, etc. Uh, they adopted a number of laws uh, in 1992. For the most part, these laws were using the same language which was used in laws before the war. So the laws that we saw earlier in the Nazi regime, you didn't find the same language. There were decrees adopted by municipal assemblies, which, for example, would not allow more than three Muslims to assemble in, the municip in, in, in public. So there were such decrees, but the laws themselves were quite uh, yeah, similar to, to the laws that available in the criminal code before the war. Um, one of the major differences, of course, was that it was adopted by the Republika Srpska government, which was an entity uh, with yeah, a, a dubious agenda at the time. Um, the, now the laws were adopted by the government, so the, the central government, as well as the municipal one. And as I said, they were not as overly racist as one would have uh, seen in the uh, German uh, judicial system. Now, the RS leadership had established its own judicial system, taking over from what was left from Bosnia and Herzegovina's judicial system. They officially appointed all the judges and prosecutors. And again, here we do see a purge of judges who were not of the dominant ethnic group. So in this case, uh, Bosnian uh, Muslim and Bosnian Croat judges were removed and replaced by Bosnian Serb judges. Now this was done to a varying degree from one municipality to another, but the rule was generally that if Muslims and Croats had already escaped or had not, those who had not escaped were being replaced. The uh, Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia's criminal code was still in force at the time, and pre-war criminal procedures were applied during the war. Now, with respect to a criminal complaint, just a quick little graph here to show you how the process still functioned during the war. Uh, crime, crimes were reported to a duty police officer um, during, uh, during the war. This was happening. And uh, an incident report was filled out by the police officer in each police station wherever the crimes happened. And a patrol would be sent on site when a crime took place. Uh, and following this, an investigative judge and a prosecutor would be informed. Now, at the ICTY, in the trial of the prosecutor versus Stanisic and Zhuplin, which is currently under appeal, uh, we called seven witnesses, um, former police inspectors, judges, and prosecutors, who reviewed police logbooks and court logbooks. And their conclusion was that the police there failed to report or underreported crimes committed by Serb perpetrators against non-Serbs during the war. Now, the gathering and the tedious analysis of this body of evidence was spearheaded by one of our dedicated lawyers, whose name will only be disclosed upon uh, uh, production of a reasonable written request. It is not me, by the way. Uh, this lawyer uh, dedicated uh, his uh, couple of years of his life to uh, come to the following conclusions, which were uh, confirmed uh, by the witnesses in the courtroom, that there are various ways of failing uh, to report. Uh, first of all, crime perpetrators would remain unid unidentified, which means that although the police may or may not have known the identity, they would, they would not investigate. The, if the police was aware of the perpetrator, they would withhold the names of the perpetrators. And where there were crimes, uh, no criminal reports were uh, file altogether. One prosecutor testified that uh, he had absolutely no way of doing anything independently from the police, and that was uh, the problem with that system. The police could simply say, based on available information, we're unable to identify the perpetrator, and the prosecutor had no resources to conduct his own investigation. Now, to produce this body of evidence, of course, we had to go through logbooks, criminal reports, and a detailed analysis uh, allowed, it to, allowed us to present this evidence in court. Um, so there was interference uh, with the judicial system. It was endemic at the time in the, in the Rep Republika Srpska, and it applied actually to both civilian and, and military judicial systems. Uh, very briefly, there, as I mentioned to you, the, the purge of judges, uh, this took place. And finally, one quote from the judgment, uh, but, but, but the judges found that the civilian law enforcement apparatus failed to function in an impartial, 
an impartial ma manner. If you want to see the rest of the quote, it's at paragraph 745 of volume two of this judgment. So quickly, as I have a couple of minutes left, let me turn my attention to the Ottoman Empire's judicial system. Now, what's really important to understand here is that, again, we're dealing with a v variety of material uh, primary source, but mainly secondary source in the course of this study. Uh, the judicial system was modernized in the 19th century in the Ottoman Empire through the adoption of a criminal code, which was influenced primarily by the French Code Penal. So by 1858, the, the Ottoman Penal Code had uh, two, over 260, not 265 articles. This code introduced the principle of legality and the prohibition against torture, which up until then was permitted to obtain a confession. Um, a new criminal code uh, of pr criminal procedure was adopted, which introduced the concept of uh, public prosecutors and placed the responsibility on the state to punish offenses and not on individuals, which was the case to a certain degree before this code was adopted. So, um, some older principles remained, however, notably the inadmissibility of non Muslim testimony against Muslims in courts. And this was the case that applied to uh, the Christian minorities in the Ottoman Empire. Very briefly on the Minister of, of Justice, uh, who uh, came to power in 1913, um, following the Young Turks uh, coup d'etat. Uh, this was Ibrahim Bey. He remained in power throughout uh, the war. Uh, after the war, he was accused by uh, journalists for allowing the release of prisoners from jails to enroll them in paramilitary groups. Tomorrow you will hear from Dr. Ungor the, the, the issue of paramilitary activity during the, the First World War. Uh, this Minister of Justice, however, adopted the law in 1916, which means that by that time the majority of the Armenian and other Christian communities had been deported, massacred, etc. So this, this law, which allowed to release uh, the paramilitary, the, the prisoners to, to form paramilitary groups was retroactive and was pretty much uh, rubber stamping a, a fait accompli. The Minister of Justice was arrested after the First World War. And this is an issue that is of great interest to me because there were trials held in 1919 and 1920 Several leaders were hanged. Uh, death penalty w was applied against them in the post-war uh, trials in Istanbul. And this is really important because right there, there was an acknowledgement of crimes being committed against uh, the Armenian uh, community in, 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 the, in the, um, the Ottoman Empire. However, what is lacking here, in contrast with the Nuremberg trials, was legacy. These trials were quickly shut down as the Kemalists came to power and uh, any, any chance of legacy was completely lost. But here we have a prototype of a pre-Nuremberg uh, uh, prosecution of, of, of crimes committed during an armed conflict. Here we have a very grainy picture of one of those uh, trials uh, of the uh, Ottoman leadership. I must also point out, though, that the main leaders, uh, Talat, Enver, and Jemal, managed to flee thanks to the German uh, 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 leadership and were not tried, they were tried in absentia. Um, what was interesting is during his trial, and I apologize for taking over a couple of minutes, during his trial, Ibrahim Bey testified, he did testify, and he conceded reluctantly of being fully appraised of the deportation and wholesale killing of Armenians. And he highlighted the fact that the deputies of the chamber did not lift a finger, nor did they raise the issue, nor was there any complaint or request to investigate. So similar to what we saw in the Republika Srpska, there is knowledge of criminal conduct coupled by inaction. Um, I'm not going to take too much of your time, but very quickly, in terms of the policy regarding uh, the investigation of crimes against uh, Armenians and other minorities, um, there were already uh, indicators before the war that this was not going to be looked into very seriously. Uh, in December of 1914, so prior to the beginning of the wholesale campaign of deportations, uh, the Reverend Sahag Odabashian was killed while traveling from Constantinople. The perpetrators were known. These were Chete, which are a band of armed irregulars, uh, who were acting under the guidance of the special organization. You will hear about the special organization tomorrow. And there is no evidence of a serious inquiry in this killing. There are other examples of, of, of the kind. And one case that is very interesting um, is the 
uh, case of the massacres in Adana. This is five years before the beginning of the Armenian genocide. Uh, Adana is, uh, again, a town which is in southeast uh, Turkey. And in 1909, uh, a massacre of 30,000 Armenians uh, took place uh, at that time. Now, what happened is quickly or shortly after the, the uh, this massacre, a joint Armenian-Turkish commission was established to look into the crimes. Uh, the young Turks apparently would have dragged their heels in this investigation. Uh, and one author claims that no one from the leadership was prosecuted for this large-scale massacre. Now, this is again coming back to my comment this morning, the issue of looking into the details to unearth some interesting information. Um, in Adana, well, in Aintab, actually, there was a, an American doctor, Dr. Shepard, who was there since 1882. He provided relief during the Hamidian massacres of uh, 1895, and he provided relief during the Adana massacre. Although he was uh, located in Aintab, Aintab is not uh, that far from Adana, although at the time it took him two, three days to get to Adana. He wrote about the post-massacre investigation. He wrote about the fact that uh, courts martials were established and investigating committees met in villages such as Bakhche and Haroni and that there was a central court with its seat uh, in Erzin, which issued death sentences to approximately 70 perpetrators, including the Mufti of Adana. And I want to finish with this remark here, because he writes that um, when all is said, it remains that in the case of the Adana massacre, 70 Muslims were hanged for killing Christians in a general uprising. And when you stop to think how hard it is to secure the conviction and punishment of those who kill people in a mob in this country, these results, far from justice as they are, will not look so meager after all. What does that mean? What does Dr. Shepard's uh, analysis bring to us? I think to me what it means, it, it demonstrates that there was a functioning judicial system which was able to investigate, which was capable of issuing sentences, but that during the First World War decided to turn a blind eye. And that is uh, kind of the, uh, the gist of, of, of uh, my presentation on this point. I thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>